Welcome to the Chaos Sector. In the previous episode, we mentioned how we will focus on the mainstream media's role in performing damage control. But what I want to take the time to address is Pullman, Washington. Yeah, see, there was a conspiracy from Pullman as well. We mentioned this in the previous episode and also the previous series, but let's kind of dig deeper into it. Now, Koberger was a teacher assistant, as we all know, and we all know he had been terminated from that job. Okay, but let's break down not only that termination, but also the time frame that all of that occurred that same year. My colleague will do the honors. Thanks. Now, I'm going to speed through this because it's basically a full background of his time at WSU. Quote, the Ph.D. student charged with murdering four University of Idaho undergraduates displayed such troubling behavior in the weeks around the killings that his university investigated his conduct around women, counseled him over a verbal altercation with a professor, and ultimately fired him from his job as a teacher assistant, according to interviews and a university record. Less than two weeks before the killings in November, the Ph.D. student, Brian Koberger, was called to a meeting with faculty members to discuss growing concerns about his behavior, according to the record, a timeline the university prepared justifying its decision to terminate him. The meeting was part of a series of discussions over Mr. Koberger's conduct during his criminology studies at Washington State University, which lies about seven miles west of the University of Idaho. The faculty's concerns with Mr. Koberger grew in the weeks after the November 13 killings, though he had not yet been identified as a suspect. They culminated in the Criminal Justice Department's unusual decision to terminate Mr. Koberger from his teaching assistant role in December, shortly before his arrest, according to three people familiar with his time at the university, and a formal letter to Mr. Koberger informing him that he had failed to meet the conditions required to maintain his funding under the program. The faculty made the decision at the department's end-of-year meeting in December, during which professors were also told that some female students reported that Mr. Koberger had made them feel uncomfortable. In one of those instances, Mr. Koberger was accused of following a female student to her car, according to two people familiar with the situation, who spoke on condition of anonymity, because they were not authorized to discuss the case. In the case of the female students, the university's investigation did not find Mr. Koberger guilty of any wrongdoing, two people said, and it was other matters that prompted the decision to eliminate his funding and remove him from the teaching assistant job. That decision, they said, was based on his unsatisfactory performance as a teaching assistant, including his failure to meet the norms of professional behavior in his interactions with the faculty. Mr. Koberger began having troubles about a month into the fall semester, his first at Washington State. He had an altercation on September 23, with John Snyder, the WSU professor he was assisting, according to the termination letter, a copy of which was obtained by the New York Times. Then, on November 2, department leaders met with Mr. Koberger to discuss an improvement plan, the letter recounts. Eleven days later, the four University of Idaho students were stabbed to death overnight in a home, just off campus in Moscow, Idaho. In the termination document, officials described a second altercation that Mr. Koberger had with the professor after the killings, on December 9. Later that month, the department decided to remove him from his position as a teaching assistant, cutting his pay and saying that he had not made progress regarding professionalism. Phil Weiler, a vice president and spokesman for WSU, said a federal student privacy law prohibited him from commenting in detail on Mr. Koberger's history with the university. He said only that Mr. Koberger was no longer enrolled at the university. Mr. Koberger's lawyer did not respond to a message seeking comment on Friday. Mr. Koberger is being held in jail after being charged with four counts of murder, he has said through a lawyer that he looks forward to being exonerated. The Times previously reported that students had complained about Mr. Koberger's harsh grading in his teaching assistant role, resulting in a classroom discussion in which he sought to defend the feedback he provided the students. Mr. Koberger had entered the program at WSU, after earning a master's degree in June at DeSales University, in Center Valley, Pennsylvania, not far from where he had spent his teenage years, struggling with emotional problems and drug addiction. Records show that after the initial altercation with the professor on September 23, Mr. Koberger met with a university official to discuss norms of professional behavior. By October 21, a professor emailed him about the ways in which you had failed to meet your expectations as a teaching assistant thus far in the semester. Some of the details of Mr. Koberger's troubles and eventual firing were first posted online by an Arkansas woman who has closely followed the case. For weeks after the killings, investigators did not identify a suspect. Records show that Mr. Koberger was still working in his teaching assistant job at the time and was continuing to grade undergraduate students' papers. About a week after his second altercation with the professor, as the semester was drawing to a close in mid-December, Mr. Koberger began driving across the country with his father to the family's home in Pennsylvania. Officials notified Mr. Koberger of his termination on December 19, according to the university timeline. He was arrested at the end of the month. The authorities cited DNA that appeared to link him to a knife sheath found at the crime scene, video showing a white car in the neighborhood of the crime scene that resembled Mr. Koberger's car, and phone records indicating that Mr. Koberger's phone disconnected from the cell network during those key early morning hours. Unquote. I'll let you guys break that down, as I see a lot of problems with this article. Well done. And we will definitely break it down. 
There are some glaring problems in this report regarding Koberger's termination. Now we'll just go down the line based on the article. Less than two weeks before the killings, Koberger was called to a meeting with faculty members to discuss growing concerns about his behavior. I don't have time for this, already agitated in just dealing with this article. Not going to go all over the place piecing this crap together. Yeah, it's a lot of that frustration going around right now. But let's keep digging. Records show that after the altercation with the professor on September 23rd, Koberger met with a university official to discuss the norms of professional behavior. The norms of professional behavior? To me, that sounds like Koberger never actually violated any school policy or even conduct, right? It sounds like a way of teaching was not preferred, and that can be subjective and problematic. But anyway, let's move on. By October 21st, a professor emailed him about the ways in which he had failed to meet his expectations as a teacher assistant thus far in the semester. Again, this is a very subjective issue, because how can we tell if Koberger actually did anything wrong? Just because he had, quote, altercations with the professor does not mean he did anything wrong. He could have been defending his stance against accusations, which obviously would lead to most people, if not all, who would strongly defend their position or even innocence. We'll come back to that, of course. But it goes on to say, some of the details of Mr. Koberger's troubles and eventual firing were first posted online by an Arkansas woman who has closely followed the case. What? Really, you're telling me she was the first who posted that information online? Oh, she's closely following the case. Oh yeah, now I understand. An Arkansas woman posted that information about a suspect attending a university in Washington. Where are all the people who complained about how he taught? What about the staff who had issues with him? Surely they have easier and quicker access to that information, right? Because that woman is actually from Washington, but moved to Arkansas after plotting against Koberger. And of course she will follow the case closely. Yeah, it's evident there were snakes at WSU plotting against Koberger. And here are some more. I want to go back to the accusations of Koberger harassing female students. They claim he made them feel, quote, uncomfortable. Two people claim to, well, I guess, witness this harassment, in which Koberger was seen following the female to her car, right? Yet, the university's investigation into the matter didn't find any evidence of any form of harassment. So let's stop right here for a moment. Clearly, Koberger is deemed, quote, difficult by the staff. If female students come out and say he made them feel uncomfortable, and two other unidentified individuals claim they saw him following a female to her car, surely there would be some concrete evidence that would have led to his termination off that alone. Ugh, we have to pick through the article and piece it all together. The students complained that Koberger gave them harsh grades, right? That's the problem right there. If you recall, we broke all of this down in the previous series. Now we're breaking down the actual alleged incidents. We talked about how students would perhaps give him a hard time because he wasn't, quote, cool. He would perhaps take a jab back at them. And from the jump, they hated him. Remember the female who claimed Koberger made homophobic remarks about her? Yeah, we broke that down as well. She was making little smart remarks about him in the classroom, perhaps turned into a social political debate, and she was no match for him intellectually. Students often try to challenge the teacher. Sometimes it's a good thing, but we can just tell based on that little smirk on her face, she was causing problems. Comes out and claims he made homophobic remarks to slander his image even more. Can't stand these type of college students. They're spoiled rotten. Remember, students in class can be really spiteful. They can ruin a teacher's career. Of course, there are some horrible and immoral teachers out there, but when it comes to students, there's a lot of uh, collective conspiring against one person in a classroom. Also, you have to remember, Koberger himself was a student and a teacher assistant. I'm going to guess there was a bit of jealousy from many college students. Here's a guy who comes to town, enrolls at the university, already has a master's degree, studying criminology, and is a teacher assistant as well. Oh yeah, there was a lot of jealousy, even from the staff. That's another key element. All this time, I never thought about that dynamic at WSU. Huh, Koberger was a new student and was offered a job or applied for it doesn't matter to become a teacher assistant. I'm sure some juniors or even seniors were raging mad that he just comes into town and is teaching in the classrooms. Yeah, that's a key factor in the case because it's linked to a motive of framing Koberger. Let's not forget the staff at WSU also. And we also have to factor in the drug trafficking element between WSU and the University of Idaho, which we also broke down. 
WSU students, a bit agitated with Koberger's presence, not a drug user, not a drug dealer, and is a teacher assistant along with being a student? To those students, he's a major problem. You know what? Why even focus on the rest of the article? I think it's confirmed. This is how they identified Koberger. Yep, we broke down the frame in a different way. The frame obviously had to come from WSU. Let's just scratch the rest of the article. I'm kind of giddy to break this down. Wait, let's not just disregard it so fast. I know we can basically see what took place, but we do need to address some of those key statements and claims. The claim that Koberger struggled emotionally as a teenager and was addicted to drugs. Where in the hell is this coming from? Oh yeah, that's right, that so-called friend of his. Again, we go over that once more. If the drug of choice was heroin, then Koberger would have a criminal background, no doubt. Absolutely, he would have breaking and entering charges, theft charges, even assault charges. The sister never claimed he had a drug addiction, but the so-called friends did. They even claimed he stole from that sister, apparently her cell phone. Okay, so he stole the cell phone to buy heroin? Exactly the point. That type of desperation to get your fix would lead to criminal charges. If Koberger was an angry teenager with a hard drug addiction, uh, we can suggest he would have physically harmed someone then, right? Right? Perhaps assaulted a friend, a family member, a girlfriend, random strangers walking down the street. If you're trying to connect his current image to when he was a teenager, we can even suggest he would have murdered someone when he was a teen, right? Abusing animals, abusing parents, abusing his siblings, getting into fights at school, getting kicked out of school just like he did at WSU for some unknown reason, you know? All they have is a bunch of speculation from so-called friends. And before someone mentions the whole boot camp issue, where he was harassing females and other claims he was threatening his friends, do you realize that a fucking news station in Dateline NBC literally claimed that Koberger had been identified as someone who broke into his friend's home, yet he wasn't arrested for it? He would have been arrested because whoever that so-called source was that identified him obviously would have the authorities notified about it. The friend didn't call the cops, remember? So it would have to have the authorities involved, and yet he somehow skated away without being charged. The point here is that these claims about Koberger can't be verified whatsoever. Lizard face, wait, I'm sorry for that jab, but going on TikTok and yapping about Koberger to go viral in regards to a murder case, well, she's just showing her true colors, which wasn't a friend. She claimed to be one of his close friends, who gave him that negative image more than anyone else. No family members have spoken publicly about his life as a teenager. The parents definitely haven't spoken out. The sister made a few statements, but from what I've researched, it was nothing about a drug addiction, no physical violence mentioned. All she basically said was that she suspected he may have committed the crime. See if she was a genuine sister or even the other sister. They would have released some photos of the family together, defending their brother against those accusations and charges. But they're too concerned about their reputations when it's the brother who may not even have a reputation to fix if he's sentenced to the death penalty. It indicates that they weren't as close and weren't in communication with Koberger as much when he got older. Even still, you know your brother. We assume you grew up with your brother and since they never mentioned any childhood problems, like abusing animals and such, well, why would the sister suspect him of being involved in the murders if he hadn't had a history of violence, no criminal record, and appeared to be just a guy trying to accomplish goals? Now that I think about it, that specific sister may have envied Koberger. She's in the movie industry, depressed, not really panning out the way she thought it would. And here's her brother, who she thought was a, quote, loser with a master's degree, and also working hard to obtain another degree in criminology. As the saying goes, my friends... Envy turns into dislike, dislike turns into hate, and, well, hate turns into whatever it carries with it. Such as slandering your own brother's image for the world to see. Okay, so we can scratch that slander of his image out the window. Now, we never really dug into Koberger's family, especially the sister, or sisters. But the so-called actress is the one who stated she suspected Koberger may have been involved in the murders. Both sisters were reported to have lost their jobs, due to their relation to Koberger. Oh yeah, complained about that while your brother is sitting in jail facing the death penalty. And they're not visiting him neither. Yeah, way to go. Based on this, we know Koberger was the dark horse of the family, but that doesn't mean he was a monster. There are a lot of dark horses in families, and they're just to themselves. 
In fact, sometimes it's the rest of the family that are the monsters in how they treat that relative. Then we have the timeline. Oh yes, that damn timeline. Koberger was still employed as a teacher assistant up until December 19th. Oh, fucking really. Throughout all of the student complaints, allegations of basically sexual harassment, verbal altercations with staff, somehow he was still employed as the teacher assistant up until the point the FBI had been tracking him, in which the so-called DNA found on the knife sheath had identified Koberger's family tree. Oh, okay, now you fire him because the FBI is closing in. Yeah, we see the play. At the end of the semester, Koberger is preparing to visit his parents for Christmas break. They sent him a letter notifying him of his termination. In this same time frame, the FBI has already closed in on the so-called suspect. They're snooping around following him. Put it together, the so-called private driver submitted Koberger's vehicle to Moscow PD, which was on the 7th. On the 9th, the staff have a meeting with Koberger to discuss, well, bullshit. See, they were doing this to make it appear everything was normal, but in reality, they were basically holding him in that setting to allow the FBI to set everything up. They already knew he was the suspect, but pretended like everything was normal at the university. Also, he had been kicked out of WSU as a student as well. Now we can give the termination a pass, for what it's worth. But why was he kicked out of WSU as a student? Okay, he's a bad teacher assistant based on your standards, but uh, he's still a student at the university. Quote, he said only that Mr. Koberger was no longer enrolled at the university. Unquote. And of course, he tried to cover up the reason why he wasn't enrolled at the university anymore by citing some federal student privacy policy. Oh, but all of these allegations against him aren't private right? He was accused of making females feel uncomfortable, even following a female to a car. What privacy are you upholding, if not that? Oh, the world needs to know the character of the killer's background, okay? But not why he was no longer enrolled at WSU. Oh, okay, I see. It's because they literally kicked him out due to being a murder suspect, but tried to hide it. And you better tack this on the wall, because that would mean the university knew that he was a suspect before the public knew. Heck, even Moscow PD, for that matter. And that lands right on the mark of a frame. Didn't know a student at a university can be kicked out due to problems regarding being a teacher assistant. Usually, they just lose that job. And if there are signs of similar behavior as a student, well, of course, they may be kicked out. No complaints or incident reports regarding Koberger as a student. From what has been stated, Koberger as a student was the complete opposite of what is being depicted as the teacher assistant. He was considered very intelligent and quiet, just stayed to himself. How can he be so confrontational as a teacher assistant, but quiet, meaning not confrontational or disruptive as a student? Those are two different people with two different behavioral patterns. Of course, lies are everywhere. Which magnifies the mystery of why he was kicked out of the school as a student. Yes, a student. Now going back to the spoiled brat that claimed he made homophobic remarks. Quote, Norton told the New York Papers that her class was in shock over Koberger's arrest, describing him as a smart and quiet student with an interest in forensic psychology. Norton, however, added that Koberger did keep a distance from his classmates due to anti-LGBTQ comments he allegedly made in class. Quote, he sort of creeped people out because he stared and didn't talk much. But when he did, it was very intelligent, and he needed everyone to know that he was smart, Norton told the Times. Another student who spoke with the Times, under the condition of anonymity, backed up Norton's claims and said Koberger didn't have many friends at school because of the alleged offensive remarks. Unquote. All of this is a bunch of garbage. The only thing that we can give merit to is that Koberger stayed to himself. That's it. The homophobic remark can't be justified. And the problem with this, even if he did make such a remark, maybe someone insulted Koberger and his sexuality or the perceived lack thereof if you catch my drift. So if you hit me below the belt, I'm going to return that same energy. Perhaps tells Koberger something like, hey, you think you're so smart, Koberger. Well, why don't you use that brilliance to get laid, huh? And the class laughs, of course. But Koberger has a comeback and says, trust me, I have no problem there. But you, on the other hand, you're so confused, you don't even know which gender to lay in bed with. And the class laughs at that as well. And of course, she overreacts, plays the victim, and calls him homophobic. To say that Koberger tried to convince people he was smart is obviously an indication that you were intimidated that he was smart and projected that as him being a smart mouth. See, this gets into very silly territory, often in class settings. 
Someone is smarter than you. You thought you were one of the smartest in class, and you simply start feeling insecure about it. Start making little remarks under your breath to that person and eventually it will blow up. And, perhaps due to Koberger being a bit older, there is a difference in maturity as well. I would say most of those students were ranging from 18 to 21, so they're not viewing life the same. An older college student dealing with younger ones who are fresh out of high school and still a bit spoiled. On top of that, he was a teacher assistant, so he is viewed by those classmates as a know-it-all. I'll tell you why they kicked him out. They didn't want him to be enrolled at the school when he was arrested. They tried to covertly distance themselves from Koberger, knowing he would be arrested for the murders. Yeah, pay attention. It's all aligning with the FBI's slithering covert spying on him. And WSU was a part of this, of course. Notice there wasn't anything that happened at WSU in the week of the murders. There was a so-called meeting on November 2nd with staff. In addition, WSU campus police had so-called identified Koberger's vehicle on the 29th. That would be November 29th. So if they had him already under the radar at this time, we all know that WSU campus police had informed the university about Koberger potentially being a suspect in the murders. So everything that was happening, or what is claimed to have happened from the time frame of September to December, you know what? I don't think anything happened, to be honest. I think those were fabricated incidents to cover up the fact that the university was also tracking Koberger. Once the FBI gets involved, they infiltrate everything. If Koberger worked at a typical company and was so-called under investigation, the FBI would have employees in the workplace spying on him. And that happens in society, my friends. So, of course, the university was also carrying out the covert operations for the FBI, but they tried to make it appear it was common issues at the school. And that's, that's just the tip of the iceberg, of course, because it's evident to us, and this is our theory, that Koberger was picked to be framed for the murders before it happened. Yeah, we broke that down as well. It was drug-related. Simple as that. Now, the million-dollar question here is where is the evidence from WSU that ties Koberger to Moscow, Idaho? Furthermore, he has a master's degree, he's studying criminology, and he's a teacher assistant. When did he have the time to even tiptoe around stalking girls in another state, regardless if it's relatively close? No motive exists here, because there is no evidence of a link. And that's one of the first things Ann Taylor pointed out. Koberger has no link to those victims whatsoever. Well, I guess after that November 2nd meeting with faculty, Koberger decides, I'll just go stab some college students in another town and come back and try to keep my job as a teacher assistant. The balls of steel on this guy. Hey, apparently Koberger started classes at WSU in August of 2022. Now from August, at some point, he was able to become a teacher assistant, from whenever that was, to the point he was no longer a teacher assistant and was kicked out of WSU completely. My friends, this is approximately three months. Wow, this guy was kicked out of the university within a few months for complaints regarding being a teacher assistant? Mind you, the investigation into harassment of other students didn't find anything. They claim the reason for the termination was based on his performance as a teacher assistant. Okay, fine, whatever. But from August to December, he was only enrolled for about three to four months. Now, since he's new in town, you're trying to tell the public that within this time frame, Koberger, while trying to obtain a degree at WSU, he had to also be plotting to murder someone, right? He just spotted some girls on his travels to Moscow that he became obsessed with. This would have had to happen quite fast, like within a few months between the time frame he was having problems with staff in September, October, and ultimately November, all the way up till when the murders occurred. Who would he know? Nobody has come forward and said that Koberger knew anyone specifically, nor anyone from Moscow. Well, no need for a criminology degree, because he's just decided to throw all of that away by planning on murdering someone. Actually, multiple someones. In a town he's not from, driving a light bulb at night, and left a knife sheath with his DNA on it. Oh, you know, he had been to the home in the past about 12 times, right? Let's be clear here. The travel from Pullman to Moscow is a bit short, but it's still another state. So every time that he traveled to Moscow, specifically that location, he appears more and more suspicious in the neighborhood. Never happened. All made up. Keep in mind, this would have to be during the September through November time frame. What pulled him to those specific housemates? There had to be an interaction, such as at a party or some gathering where he saw those girls up close. Where is the damn evidence? 
nothing has been proven. I've never seen a suspect be accused of stalking and murdering victims, and yet no proof they actually stalked the victims has been revealed. A stalker in a murder case would have reports that prove this, such as photos, video footage, something tangible to show that they actually stalked that victim, either it be online communication or physical interactions. The alleged photos he had of Maddie and claims that he followed her and Kaylee on social media, well, at some point, he would have had to come in contact with or heard about them. But Koberger didn't seem like the type who planked on sites like Instagram or TikTok. But apparently, the evidence, quote, exists. There were so-called screenshots of what someone claimed was his Instagram, which included a follow of Maddie, right? Well, it says, follow, not following. And there's the problem off the bat. But the second problem is that they're literally creating multiple accounts of Koberger. That's not hard to do, my friends. Just have a profile photo taken from all the ones released on social media and just create the account. Post a screenshot of that fake account, have the fake Koberger appear to follow Maddie, and then dump the screenshot out on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, etc., making it appear that the Koberger is following Maddie. But even with the fake profile, you don't even have him following Maddie probably because you would have to keep track of all the fucking activity that would be posted by Maddie, which the fake Koberger would be updated on. And that requires so much dedication and work to that fake profile, you just said to yourself, ah, fuck it. This will convince them. Now, haven't we learned a lesson already about fraudulent claims? If the news has blatantly lied on this man, claiming he had committed a prior crime without being arrested, then everyone on social media is definitely subject to just throwing out fake information. Oh wait, is that where News Nation obtained the so-called digital evidence from? Are these the source of that so-called evidence? Oh my fucking, and that's why they haven't provided any of that to the public, because it doesn't actually exist. And those are not trolls. They're people who are working to make Koberger guilty of the murders. They went out of their way to create fake profiles of this man, where they post screenshots of the fake profile associated with Maddie and also Kaylee. I don't know about you, but that seems like the work of students from Pullman and Moscow. Psst, this is just bonkers. Now that we go back and break this down even more, I think we can dig even deeper into this and tie Batman and WSU campus police into the equation because their activity is also aligning with the time frame the FBI was tracking Koberger. Yep, we're just going to keep blasting it all to smithereens. This is the chaos sector. <laughs>